Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Marcus Lutheran Church. Forty days after his triumphant resurrection from the dead, our Lord Jesus ascended into heaven. Today we commemorate that ascension and we seek to gather strength from it, the strength of knowing that the almighty Lord Jesus rules in heaven right now for our eternal good. God bless you as you worship him today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and we deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Christ, though you spent your earthly years in meekness and humility, all humility is now gone. 
you rule in splendor and light in your Father's presence, ascended and supreme. We praise and bless your name this morning for completing your Savior work so that our hearts might be comforted with the secure knowledge that your Father loves us as his children. Intercede for us so that all of the Father's blessings will be ours and defend us with your mighty power so that the evil one will not harm us in body or soul. We pray in your holy name, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is the Holy Gospel for the Ascension of our Lord, taken from Luke chapter 24. Just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus told us, his disciples, that we would be his witnesses in this world by the power of the Spirit that he would send. We read, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, 
This is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had left them, led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. God's word for us this morning is recorded in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with the 16th verse. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet 
and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among people, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Wow. That's a, that's a long sentence. But more than any other sentence perhaps written in human history, it best describes the system of government that we have come to expect in this country, the United States of America. And it describes the privileges, the, the freedoms that we have as citizens of this country, something that we're thinking about, especially this weekend, as we remember all of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedoms. Now, you may know that that long sentence was written by Thomas Jefferson. It's in the Declaration of Independence. And every time that we vote in a free election, and nobody's pointing a gun at our head, telling us how we have to vote, which, by the way, is a privilege that is withheld from millions of people around the world. Well, every time we do that, we're saying that we agree with that system of government that was established in our country, that we believe that in our country, the government is supposed to get its power from the people who are governed. You see, all powerful kings have never been the American way. It just doesn't work that way in our country. Yeah, we've got presidents, we've got legislators, we've got judges, we've got magistrates, we've got police officers, we've got lots of people in some kind of authority, but no kings. That's just un-American. And yet, we're here this morning, gathered in uh, living rooms and kitchens and cars. We're here to think about something that doesn't really resonate with our American way of thinking about power, and it's this. We have a king, an all-powerful king, and even more than that, even though we love our liberties and we love our democracy, we're saying, I am all for having a king rule my life. I, I love King Jesus. I love that he is in control right now. On this day, when we're thinking about how he reascended to his throne on high as our king, I think these words of God before us today from Ephesians chapter 1 are going to encourage you to look for your king. Look for him in the words that you choose. Look for him in the things that you do. Look for him in the relationships that you have. Look for your ascended king. But if you're like me, you may sometimes wonder, where did he go? You know, where is he? Sure doesn't seem like he's ruling things in my life when 
things aren't going according to my definition of good or I have fear or anxiety in my life, where is King Jesus then? I hope that these words of God for you today from Ephesians chapter 1 will prove to you that Jesus is your benevolent king right now and he is ruling all things for us in heaven and he's on earth ruling all things through us. Now, if we're going to be talking about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's good for us to spend a moment or two just sort of thinking about who those people were, those Ephesians of the first century. Now, the Bible tells us that um, Paul had spent a lot of time in the city of Ephesus, which was on the western shore of what they used to call Asia Minor. Now it's called Turkey. And um, for Paul, who was, of course, a traveling missionary, right, um, he actually had spent more time in Ephesus than any other place during his uh, missionary journeys. And he had been, I guess what you would call, their pastor. And he had been their pastor for quite a while, again, by Paul's standards. But now he wasn't there anymore. When he wrote these words, he had been um, taken to Rome and he was in a house arrest situation. He didn't have freedom to do what he wanted. And the book of Acts tells us that Ephesus had a reputation, a reputation for black magic, for the occult. And before he left, Paul had told the Ephesians, I just know that there's going to be false teachers who are going to try to worm their way into your church, into your gathering of Christians, and they're going to try to tear it apart. So don't you think that it must have been a very concerned Paul who is cooling his heels in Rome. You know, he's just sitting there waiting to be on trial and yet all he can think about is his dear friends in Ephesus. But then something happened. Somehow, somebody got word to Paul that not only were his Ephesian friends uh, surviving in the faith, they were flourishing in the faith. And their love for God and their love for people was, was evident to all. And so what Paul does is he just goes on this rambling hymn of praise, this rambling sentence in Ephesians chapter 1. In, in the Greek text, it's 202 words long before you get to a period. Because that's how, that's how we talk sometimes when we're excited, right? And, and he just has to praise God for all of the good things that are happening among the Ephesians, even though times are tough for them. And he wants to tell them, I'm praying for you. I'm still praying for you. But he also wants them to know this. You've got an incredible king who is exerting his power among you right now. Paul says that when Jesus ascended into heaven, the thing that we are celebrating today, when Jesus did that, Paul says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So Jesus is ruling everything. And he's ruling everything for us believers. That is rarely the case with a human leader, or a, I guess I should say a human king. 
where they, where they rule only for the sake of their subjects. Paul had experienced during his uh, ministry a number of Roman emperors who, of course, had supreme authority. They were the king in the land. About 20 years before he penned these words by the inspiration of the Spirit, there was a Roman emperor by the name of Caligula. And around A.D. 40, this guy Caligula wanted to show his power to his people. So he ordered that a three mile long pontoon bridge be built over the Bay of Naples in Italy. Thousands of men uh, worked so very hard and they bled and many of them died to construct that bridge. And when it was finally finished, this is what King Caligula did. He got on his horse, he rode across that bridge, and then he rode back, and then he immediately ordered it to be destroyed. You see, he didn't want it to serve his subjects. He didn't want it to serve the people. He just wanted to show that he had power over the sea. There is somebody who has power over the sea and went the wind and the waves and that king, King Jesus, is in heaven right now. King Jesus has the power to heal the sick. He has the power to raise the dead. He has the power to forgive sins. He has the, the power to, to defeat Satan. He had the power think about this, to turn around the train wreck of our life apart from him as we were careening toward hell, he had the power to turn that around. All of that power King Jesus has and he exerts it for those who believe in him. You know, when Paul said he is head of over everything for the church he was talking about you and me now when i'm not impressed with the way that one of my elected officials is exerting their power i know what i want to do i want to vote them out of office and sometimes I think that's what we do with our King Jesus when we're not impressed with the way that he's exerting his power in our lives. You know, when my life is fraught with difficulty, when things aren't going my way, when I'm afraid, when, again, I, things aren't going the way that that I would call good. I kind of want to vote Jesus out of office. Uh, maybe I do that by just closing my Bible. Maybe I do that uh, when the prayers to him become just harder to say. I'm hurt, Jesus. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not getting my way. See if you get my allegiance. King Jesus. Maybe you can identify with this a bit. Today we've got to just praise God that our king wore a crown of thorns to forgive us, to take away those rebellions against him, those, those sins that we have committed against him. When Paul says for the church, Jesus is ruling for the church, he does mean you and me, and that means that he's ruling the big things in our world, including um, the spread and ultimately the stopping 
of the coronavirus. He's ruling that right now for the good of the church, which is to say, for our eternal benefit. And he's also ruling the little things in our lives with the love of a, of a shepherd king who dearly wants us to be welcomed into his heavenly flock. You know, just before he ascended into heaven, our Lord Jesus said this, I am going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me. You see, this is the way our king thinks. This is the way he's ruling in heaven right now. He's thinking about you and me and what it's going to take to bring us to him. That's our King Jesus. Trust in him. He's worthy of your trust. He deserves your trust as he's ruling in your life for your eternal benefit. What if you had been one of those apostles on the uh, Mount of Olives watching Jesus ascend into heaven? Now you heard the, uh, the, the gospel writer Luke earlier and he said that one of the attitudes that the apostles had was just to praise and honor God to glorify him and then return to Jerusalem rejoicing. I wonder um, if I would have been that apostolic. I suppose not. I wonder if my thought might have been something like this. Well, there he goes. We lost him. You know, we had a great run. I, I am so thankful for what he did for me. But there he goes. Can't see him anymore. He's gone. That's the other part of Paul's message to us today. Yes, Jesus is gone, I suppose, from our physical eyes. Um, he is, and that's a good thing, because he's ruling all things from heaven. But the Bible is really clear when Paul talks to us today. He says he's also doing all things on earth through us. Now, in the Bible, there is, there's no more um, full-length portrait of the church of Jesus Christ than Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter, Paul wants to talk about what the church looks like. And he says, those who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they look all sorts of different ways. They come from all sorts of different backgrounds. But they've all been reconciled to God and to one another by the blood of Jesus. And then when he talks about a gathering of Christians, you know, a, a group like St. Marcus Lutheran Church, a, a group that comes together to worship him and to do his work. Paul says there's an incredible diversity among the people in a congregation. There's a diversity of, of attitudes. There's a diversity of personalities. There's a diversity of gifts and talents. But within it all, he says, there is a unity because that's Jesus working through us. And I think all of this, this, this description of what a church is, it's, it's maybe best um, summarized 
in, in Paul's final words to us this morning. Jesus is the head over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So that's it. Christ is the head, but we are his body. And ascension is a time to remember both. And it's an incredible comfort to know that, that our head reigns on high and he's controlling all things for our good. But isn't it thrilling to think that Jesus chooses to operate in this world through us? Now think about that. He, uh, does the Almighty God need us to do his work in this world? Of course not. But in his grace and in his mercy, he chooses us to be his hands, his heart, his mouth, his feet in this world. And this explains what Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. And I want you to just think about a few of these uh, familiar passages. For instance, Jesus said, where two or three come together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So that means on this planet, in this world, in this life, when we come together, whether virtually or in person, to pray, praise, give thanks, share the gospel with each other, we're doing the work of Jesus Christ. That's the head among us, the body. Jesus once said, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. You know what that means? That means that Jesus knew that his ascension, his going to the Father, would usher in this period of even greater miracles than the ones he performed. What? How does that happen? It only happens through us, his body. Jesus working through us, his body. And think about the millions of souls that have been brought to faith in the Lord Jesus as, as Christ the head sent his spirit to work through us, his body. And he gave us the gospel to proclaim throughout the world. Millions of people have been brought to faith in Jesus Christ, and you know that each one of those conversions is a mighty miracle, a mighty miracle. And so Jesus said, you're going to do even greater miracles than these. And I just want you to think, too, about this, this word. Right before his ascension, Jesus said, go and make disciples. And do that by baptizing, by teaching. And know this, I'm with you. I'm with you always. Isn't that the head working through us, his body? Now this is a, a, a thrilling thought. I, I'm utterly amazed by it, this, this whole deal of like how we actually do Jesus' work, even though we're very imperfect, broken people. Uh, it is thrilling. And, and I don't mean to be a wet blanket here. But there are, I, I think we have to take some warning. Because there's a couple of ditches on either side of the road that we can fall into. We can fall into the ditch of pride, as if, um, well, Jesus sure is lucky to have me around because I am doing his work unlike any other in his church. 
Or we could fall into the other ditch on the other side of the road, which is the ditch of apathy. Ah, who cares? Really doesn't matter what I do in this world. Doesn't matter how I express my faith. Why? Because Jesus doesn't need me anyway, right? And um, since there's others to do the work, I'll just let them do it. And I think probably in our life, right, we have been in both of those ditches. How do we avoid those ditches? Just by listening to God. Listen to God, tell it like it is. And he says to us today, you're my body. You are my fullness. You are the ones who do my glorious work. You actually complete me. You are my hands to give my blessing to people in this world. You are my arms to wrap around the miserable. You are my heart to go out to people around the world. You are my legs to travel to distant lands with the gospel. You are my feet to bring good news to those near and far. Here's the thing. He is the head and we are the body. Not we might be the body. We are. Let us be, brothers and sisters, exactly who we are. And look for your king as he operates through you in this world. One last thought. In the gospel I read earlier from Luke 24, the story of Christ's ascension into heaven, this is my favorite sentence. While he was blessing them, he was taken up to heaven. I love that picture of Jesus as he's leaving, as he's ascending, he's blessing them the whole time. I hope you feel that way about Christ's ascension too. Oh, he has blessed you. You are blessed to have a king in heaven who rules all things for you and you are blessed to have a king on earth who is doing all things through you. Hail, King Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our faith in God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May God bless you as you worship him with your offering.
In our prayers this morning, we will be asking the Lord to bless Jerry Luckett and his family. Jerry lost his brother, Ray, this past week, who passed away at the age of 66. A memorial service was held for him this past Thursday. We're also going to be praying for the friends and family of uh, Ron and Lois Mitzel in Midland, Michigan, and really all of the residents of Midland, Michigan, who have, uh, who have experienced terrible historic flooding. We'll be praying for Samantha Evans. Uh, Samantha is a member of our congregation, fiance of Brad Reinhardt, and uh, she has received a call from St. Marcus to serve as one of our main campus fourth grade teachers. And we'll be, we'll be praying to remember all those who have perished in uh, wars, wars to protect our liberties as we observe Memorial Day uh, tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord God, send your tender mercies into the heart of Jerry Luckett and his family as they mourn Ray's passing. We Thank you for being raised, loving God in life and in death, for receiving him into your everlasting arms through the blood of Jesus. And now we ask that you comfort the Luckets with the sure hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Dear Lord, walk with all of our friends and loved ones in Michigan who, who bear the heavy cross of historic flooding. Make them whole, first spiritually and emotionally, and ultimately, if it be your good and perfect will, financially. Uh, lead us to reach out with love and compassion and, and use these tough times to draw them closer to you by calling upon you in the day of trouble. And we pray for Samantha, as she deliberates our call to serve. Help her to find peace and contentment in her decision and bless her with a long career of teaching your, your tender lambs. And Lord God, we thank you for the liberties we have in this country, especially the freedom to worship you without fear. On this Memorial Day weekend, we remember with gratitude all the men and women who gave their lives in defense of that freedom, bless their descendants and all of us with a spirit of appreciation for their ultimate sacrifice and for your loving governance over the affairs of history to advance your mighty mission in this world. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. All these things we bring before you, Lord Jesus Christ, in your most holy name. And now, all together, we pray the prayer which you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Thank you for being here with us in worship today. God bless your Memorial Day observance tomorrow. Please pray for our St. Marcus Church leadership as decisions are being made as to how best um, to reopen and have um, in-person worship once again. No decision, no final decisions have been made yet, but we certainly are in the process of doing that. And stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned through email and uh, our YouTube channel for announcements and ways to, um, to grow in your faith through the Word of God. God bless you as you consider your ascended King. Have a great week, everybody.